Welcome back to the Darius Gantt Show. I'm your host, Darius Gantt, as well as founder and CEO of Tesoro AI. Tesoro AI helps companies to build and scale their AI initiatives and AI teams. On this podcast, we focus on cutting edge technology, more specifically, artificial intelligence. By getting up close and personal with both founders and executives who are building these technologies, we learn their step-by-step -step process for building AI-driven solutions. Also, we get front row seats to the real world problems and business problems that AI is solving today. In this episode, we sit with Pat Calhoun, who is the founder and CEO of a company by the name of Espresso. Espressive is leveraging artificial intelligence to automate the resolution of help desk tickets. Their mission is to bring a consumer-like experience to employee self-help in the enterprise. Pat himself is a serial entrepreneur. He previously founded a company by the name of Airspace and grew that business to 80 million in revenue in just two years before it got acquired by Cisco for $450 million. With all of Pat's experiences, it's definitely gonna be interesting to see exactly how he thinks about scaling an AI-driven company. If you or your team is considering building an AI solution, make sure you reach out to the team here at Tesoro AI. We've assembled the leading experts in data science and machine learning. So whether we're talking about AI consulting, custom software development, staff augmentation, or data labeling, we got a strong team here that has your back. So head over to www.tesoroai.com. All right, without further ado, let's hop in and chat with Pat. I want to kick things off, you know, just learning a little bit more about your background. I think you mentioned having had a customer support background initially and then eventually transitioning into kind of the develop, development side. I would love to learn more about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Started my career working the front lines, answering the phone, dealing with technical challenges and helping customers deal with a lot of that. It, it, it was the beginning of my tech career. Found myself really loving, even from a, a young kid, I would be playing with uh, all kinds of stuff that you would call computers back then. Now it's not even a watch, but eventually became a developer and uh, really loved the development side of the world. Worked on a number of really cool products, always in the communication space, though, always kind of in the networking space. Eventually started my, my first startup called Airspace, which was phenomenal, where we really completely transformed how enterprises thought and deployed Wi-Fi and did a lot of development there. When I was at Airspace, though, and I started the company not even knowing how to spell the word business, um, <laughs> but eventually found myself in a different role where I had more of a public-facing side where I'd work with customers, work with analysts, and that was a, the beginning of my outbound world. And then uh, after we were acquired by Cisco, which was a phenomenal exit, is really where Cisco started grooming me into becoming more of a general manager. And that was sort of the end of my development world. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I've had this really interesting transition and I still love development. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. I guess at what point did you identify artificial intelligence as a tool that, look, one day I may be able to implement this into an idea or one yeah. day I could implement this into an idea I currently have? Yeah. Well, let me talk about, obviously we do a lot in the AI world today and I'll talk uh -huh. about what we do in just a moment, but I'm going to take you back to my first startup, which was Airspace. Okay. And so the problem that we were trying to solve at the time is when you deploy Wi-Fi at scale inside an organization, you have hundreds of access points, right? These little widgets, right? And by themselves, they're emitting this RF. And in order to really get great performance, you have to manage RF. So mm -hmm. how do you manage RF? Like most people don't even know how to, what is RF really and how RF. do you manage that? So what we ended up doing is basically building a bunch of models or algorithms essentially to go and understand how RF was being propagated and really adapt to the environment. So a Starbucks shows up next door with a hotspot, we would have to be detecting that and make sure that we're remapping the whole system. That in itself was the beginning of machine learning for me, right? Mm -hmm. The beginning of machine learning for, in my career, even though back then we didn't really use the word machine learning, but that's essentially what we were doing. We're collecting all this RF data and try to create a better model. So then I ended up going in, you know, in, into more the, the kind of the security space and so on, and then found my, myself at, at, at ServiceNow as you 
where mm -hmm. I was essentially running all their applications. And it was wonderful because I really got to see what life was like today for a support analyst. Again, I started my career in support. And so ServiceNow is really about creating ticketing tools to really help the support team really visualize and manage their, manage their tasks, et cetera. But I started seeing this change in the consumer behavior. And I'm sure that you use Alexa, you use Google mm -hmm. Home or something. And I'm sorry if I just woke her up in your home. But what I started seeing is that people as consumers were starting to interact with these things to start looking for just basic information, right? What if we could do that at work? So that was that idea was the beginning of how do I now take this, this AI to the next level for the enterprise? Right. Right. Yeah. And that is essentially what Espressive is today. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could walk us through, I mean, through that process of moving from, because you came from ServiceNow and then I did. immediately after started Espressive? Not immediately. And when I left ServiceNow, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. I'd done a startup before. I told myself I'd never do it again. I mean, it's taxing right? Yeah. Both physically and mentally, it is taxing. And it's not until you have something that just is eating, or at least for me, that eats me inside that I say, okay, it's actually worth jumping off and, and doing this again. And so I think it took me about three months to convince myself that I believed in this idea so much that I was going to go do it. So here's an interesting story. So I go see a VC and, and I, I have just this idea. And I'm like, what do you think of this idea? And I'm just looking for some valid, some basic validation. And he comes back and says, okay, I'm ready to give some money. Wow. Now, remember these people made money, right? From me the first time around, right? So it's okay. a little bit different now than it was the first time. It wasn't like people were throwing money at me the first time around, but you know, after you've had one success, right? Things are a little bit easier. And so I said, well, let me get an additional data point. So I went to see another VC. I got the exact same response. So that was enough for me to convince myself that this was what I was going to go do next. See, so that's interesting, right? Because you have companies that are able to raise around prior to having a product. So essentially you're raising yep. around off of an idea. And I think for you, a lot of that success came from just having a previous success. Was it also that the VC already understood the space? Like, were there other dynamics that allowed you to do that prior to actually having a product with users or customers? I think a good part of it was the fact that I had a history. <clears throat> so that always just gets you to the front of the line, mm -hmm. but it's not sufficient, right? They want to make sure that, that it's a market that they believe in. Yeah. And it's a little hard to do that when it's a market that doesn't actually exist. So what I was talking about doing didn't actually exist, uh, but everybody saw the successes that ServiceNow went through and everybody resonated with the concept that historically the help desk is something that's always been managed by people, mm -hmm. right? Whenever you, you need help from IT or you need help from maybe finance or HR, there's always people involved in every question that you have. And so the thesis was, we need to find a way to start automating that using NLP, AI, and other technologies, right? The, I think people just realize that with all of the automation that's going on in the world today, that was probably the next place where automation was going to happen. So I think they just, in, intuitively, they just believed that it made sense. Okay. There was no data. There wasn't a whole lot of data, right? But Because no, nobody was really doing this four and a half years ago. Yeah. And, and were they investors who had had previous experience with AI driven products, or is it more so, look, we know that this problem exists and we can have a certain level of confidence in that there's demand for, there's a market for this. Yeah. Four and a half years ago, anything that had the, uh, the letters A and I in them, it was getting a lot of attention. And, <laughs> but I, I also think that from an investment standpoint, it also had a little bit of a bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of it. There was a lot of everything was being layered with AI. You're probably trying to fundraise for a running shoe company and you found a way to include AI. <laughs> <in your> AI pitch. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think that investors were a little bit weary, but at the same time, there was a lot of excitement. But I believe that part of it was because the future of AI and the people just inherently believed in it. But the applicability of AI is also very important. Like we were not trying to build just a generic platform. We were going after a very specific problem. Yeah. So the applicability, I think, also helped help them feel more comfortable with the idea. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, uh, right? Because I think there was a time when investors were kind of 
they didn't really have the technical skills to know whether this is a real AI product or whether the the yeah. founder is saying this is AI. And so what we've seen on the Tesoro AI side, right, is folks are coming and said, hey, I kind of pitched this AI product and we're going to go to market or for to raise capital, but we need to actually build out the AI <laughs> capabilities so that we can actually have some tangible uh, stuff there, right? And, yep. and now it's interesting because you see a couple things happening is there are folks who are actually doing due diligence over the AI on the investor side. And then you've also got like, Hey, I'd like to put my engineers on, on the platform to test it out. Right. Which at that point it's like, all right, yeah, we better have our ducks in a row. So that's been an interesting development that I've seen moving over the last few years. Yeah. I think when you're a relatively new founder, someone who doesn't necessarily have the experience, you have to be able to prove that you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that the level of diligence required for those people is just going to be dramatically different. Yeah. 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 So yeah. for Espressive, talk to me about kind of what you saw in the market, right? We're seeing some of these um, IT tickets, help desk issues come about in, in your time at ServiceNow, but then as you- yeah. Look, it could be, because it had to be something very strong to draw you from, hey, I'll never start a startup again to this problem absolutely needs to be solved, right? Well, I'm sure you've had your share of technical issues. Yes. Uh, maybe sometimes even with Zoom. But what I was seeing when I was talking to virtually every CIO that ever, that when I was at ServiceNow, everybody was telling me exactly the same thing. They said, I'm using this wonderful tool called ServiceNow and it's helping me digitize a lot of my back office processes. But when it comes to the employee experience, it's like 1995. Mm. People are still calling and emailing for help. There's, we've tried and we've tried to build these health self, self help tools. Nobody wants to use them. And so virtually hundred percent of employee issues is requiring human intervention. Right. And that just doesn't scale. It's expensive, but it's not just expensive Darius. The problem is in the help desk, and I started my career there, so I know people go into the help desk as a step, as, as really as a stepping stone into their career. It's not where people really want to be long term. It's you know, and so the average attrition rate in the help desk, according to analyst uh, reports, is forty one percent. So put yourself in the shoes of a CIO. Yeah. You're funding this team to go and help your employees, your end users get phenomenal experience, phenomenal service. 41% of your people are leaving, which means tribal knowledge is constantly leaving. And technology is so complex and every company is so unique that it takes on average 250 hours for somebody to get trained to really understand the internal processes, the tools, et cetera. So you never get to a point where you have phenomenal crew across the board delivering a great experience to your employees, right. which means your CSAT ends up getting impacted negatively. So most CIOs care a lot about CSAT. So now, as I started talking to these CIOs, I came to realize, what if we could leverage technology and take a problem, which according to Gartner, takes on, on average three days and 10 hours to get resolved. Mm -hmm. How about if we took that from three days and 10 hours to 30 seconds, mm. right? You've now taken what the industry or IT typically calls the mean time to resolution or MTTR. Right. You now take that average amount of time it takes for you to resolve a ticket from three hours, three days and 10 hours to seconds. It's just, it just dramatically changes your landscape. But also if you're an employee, you get immediate help, mm. right? I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think about the time someone is just makes the, from the time something goes wrong to the time they call to the time you actually get someone on the line and then they have to go through this process of solving it, right? Like that's a lot of time that a lot of downtime, I should say, but then you it's add a lot of the complexity of employee turnover, having to retrain folks, job dissatisfaction, I and mean, how that impacts morale. I can definitely see exactly. you know, a lot of different exactly. um, benefits from, from what you guys are building. Exactly. Yes. And I know last year, I'm just going to add one more thing to that. So in last year, all of us ended up going from working from home and that has had a really significant impact on everybody. So a lot of folks who are now working from home have a lot of distractions, whether it's kids that are actually have to attend virtual schools, whether it's babies, you can't get your kids in daycare, whatever that happens to be. So as an employee, where when you had a technical problem, you probably just shoulder tap your neighbor, 
first of all, that neighbor is not there anymore. But secondly, when you have a technical problem, the window of time that you have to be able to get work done is limited because of all of the external circumstances, right? So now it's like the company has to basically fit your schedule, not the other way around. And so if you have a technical problem and you're calling in and it's going to be a two and a half hour waiting time or whatever that happens to be, it's not going to get resolved until the next day. So this is now really also impacting employee productivity. Yeah. And what does it feel like to actually interact? Like how is someone, how are they interacting with it, with Espresso and, and what are the yeah. that you're actually automating? Well, one of the things that we learned when we were at ServiceNow is if you build a portal or whatever it happens to be, some kind of a capability to help employees get self-service, for the convenience of IT, they will not do it. Hmm. Nobody's going to go out of their way to go find a self-service portal. And it's like, no, <laughs> like, no, I, for the past 15 years, I've been calling or emailing the help desk. That's exactly what I'm going to keep on doing. Okay. Even if the CIO sends this nice little message that says, oh, please use our portal. People are not going to do it. They just don't have time. And when you have a problem, the last thing you're remembering is that email from eight months ago that somebody asked you to do something, right. you know, to help them. So our philosophy has always been meet the employees where they are. If they pick up the phone, then you have to be able to intercept that. If they send an email, you have to be able to intercept that. If they go to an intranet, you have to be able to intercept that. Now we're seeing a lot more organizations deploying Slack and Teams or other collaboration tools mm -hmm. as a means for employee to be able to raise their hand and ask for help. You have to be able to intercept that. So this omni-channel capability is really critical in driving up adoption. Now you're actually deflect, what we call it deflecting tickets, meaning you were not creating a ticket, we're helping the employee, but we're deflecting a ticket without somebody even asking for it. It just happens. Interesting, interesting. So then I pick up the phone or where do I go to report an issue? And at what point does Espresso step in to reduce that MTTR? Yeah, well, let's just say that I sent an email, right? So I'm gonna send an HR email just for a moment, right? So I'm sending a, Hey, I am new to the U.S., just re relocated from Asia, and I want to know what are the company holidays. So I send that off to HR because I can't figure out where the data is. It's somewhere <laughs> deep inside the internet, <laughs> and I'm too lazy, so I'm just going to go make it somebody else's problem. Uh -huh. So I'm going to send that, that email, and then I can re get a response back that actually has all the information right in the email. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, okay, that was pretty cool. And I actually don't even really know that it was an AI that responded to it. I mean, if I looked, I would actually know, but it just comes back as a response. But then it says, hey, if you need additional help, I'm happy to answer a question. And that's where we will connect you then to a human. So there are times when the answers don't necessarily solve your particular problem. And that happens. Right. Or maybe for me, Maybe I'm a contractor and I have a different circumstance and I didn't really include that inside the request. Mm -hmm. So I can now say, okay, I need it. I need additional information. And then we're going to connect you to a human. So we're not trying to hide the humans, right? We have to make sure that if you really want to drive adoption, that we actually connect you to a human when AI is not able to help you. Wow. That is very critical in ensuring that you get good adoption and good satisfaction rates. Very interesting. So it sounds like just based on the use case, that particular use case, there's a kind of heavy use of natural language understanding to where you're under, you, you understand the sentiment, you're understanding, you're having to go in and understand what these folks actually want. And then you can send right. back a response that actually right. solves the issue. And when not, then that's you can right. bounce it to a human. Yep, that's right. But now one of the problems that we had is that the human languages and humans are just inherently unreliable and unpredictable in what they're <laughs> going to say. So something like a password reset, there's probably a hundred thousand different ways of expressing that. Mm -hmm. Our job is to make sure that we can understand that, right? We can understand all those different permutations of different phrase variations, different words, different everything for, so that is our job, but it goes beyond that. As you probably know, a lot of NLP stacks out there operate off keywords, right? So you're basically looking for these magical words, and then you make a decision based on the presence of those words, right? If you're an Alexa user, give this a try. Say, Alexa, play anything but Adele. Darius, do you know what Alexa will do? Play Adele. <laughs> exactly. It's going to play Adele. Because I heard play, heard Adele. Everything else is like filler words, right? But in our world, we can't get away with that. 
because unfortunately in the tech world, we have its tendency to over abuse existing words. I'll use the word Workday as an example, right? Mm -hmm. Workday is a very popular HR app. It also happens to be something that happens from Monday to Friday. Right. And so when people use the, work, wor the word Workday, we can't just assume that they're talking about an application. Like if I said, I can't access Workday, well, that's clearly that's an IT problem. But mm -hmm. if I said, today's my Workday, I can't access the elevator, well, it has nothing to do with the application. It actually has to do with the fact that I can't get into an elevator. So we ended up having to build our own NLP stack Mm -hmm. that actually decomposes the phrase and understands the true meaning of the phrase, the context of the phrase, not just making decisions based on the presence of a keyword. Yeah, in my mind, that because you could just train on a bunch of general data and you'll get very bad predictions. So yep. to your point, it's, all right, well, we need to be able to understand the exact requests that are being made in the context of the request or what our business is. In order to get that data, I'm curious about the collection problem. Like, where do you go to get that data? And then what's the process of actually making sure that data is accurate so you're training your models to have your accurate predictions? Yeah. <clears throat> We've come up with a, I think, a really, really unique architecture. We call it the employee language cloud. But what we tried to do is we tried to essentially replicate what a lot of the consumer virtual agent tools like an Alexa or Google or what have you in the enterprise. So if you think about the fact that most organizations that have tried to build their own chatbot, the number one problem they have is they have a lack of data, right? So they end up building a chatbot that doesn't understand anything because it doesn't have data. You're asking it about resetting a password and it's telling you about running shoes, right? So because it doesn't have enough data, so it gets very confused. So we ended up building an architecture where whenever an employee at one of our customers interacts with our virtual agent, which coincidentally is called Barista. Whenever that is wrong, we end up getting a fully anonymized scrub version of that in initial interaction. We remove PII data, we anonymize it, all that stuff. So we don't actually know where it comes from. We don't really know why. We don't know what happened afterwards. We just wanna see the phrase structure that either we did not recognize or that confused us. Once we see that, we fix it in the employee language cloud Okay. And everybody gets an update. So essentially, once we see one problem, we're fixing it for every customer. So it's a very, it's a very unique architecture that we've come up with. And of course, customers can also, you know, customize their own local environment. So because every company has their own language, their own acronyms, their own proprietary software, hardware, benefits, whatever. But this concept that we have, this architecture called the Employee Language Cloud, is what got us from understanding virtually nothing three and a half years ago right. to over 1.7 billion things today. Got it, got it. And so was it the situation, when you first built out the software, was it that you were able to train on some partner data or were you starting off with a, a pre-built model and then over time as you gather data for partners, the system got smarter? through the architecture that you're, you're referring a to? A combination of all the above. We ended up outsourcing, crowdsourcing. We ended up doing all kinds of stuff to get as much data as we could to get that initial seed. And then it was an all hands on deck to just constantly refine the model. We, of course, now at four and a half years in, we've got a lot of tools to help us automate a lot of that. But as when AI doesn't know that it's got something wrong, there's no automated tool for that, right? So there's still some people involved today, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm always curious about some people do it internally, some people do it externally through vendors. Some people use just a sort of completely automated solution. Were there, were there things that worked? Were, were there things in, in, in situations where you saw these different ways of labeling that data work better than others? We do everything internally. So I'm a big believer that I own the custom, my end customer's experience. We will live or die by that. And mm -hmm. so I have to be able to control that. So that we do not outsource. Everything is done internally. We built our own tools for it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Super, super helpful. And then we didn't talk about the team that you, you built. I mean, you had the idea come out. Did you start with kind of a co-founder that you built the business with or how was, how were the early days as it relates to the initial team? Yeah. Well, hiding deep inside the bowels of some VC uh, office. 
when I got the initial funding, I, I went and uh, first person, well, first couple of people I hired, one of them was the first product manager ever at ServiceNow. I wanted somebody that just was a domain expert wow. in the world of service management. To me, that's really important. My second hire, well, not necessarily in that order, was my head of engineering, my chief architect at my last startup. The guy is just the brightest person I know in the world. And I gave him the keys and I said, go build me a phenomenal platform. And he did exactly that. And then that was the impetus. That was, that was the initial team, right? So we hid kind of in the basement, hired a couple of people that we were all connected to. I, I think probably the first 25, 30 people, they're all in our network. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, exactly. Okay. And mostly engineering or did you have folks who were kind of client focused, client facing first? Everybody was product manager, engineering. I guess I was probably the closest to being client focused because I, I given my role, but initially we really didn't do a whole lot of, we talked to some customers, especially like X service now, or sorry, no service now customers because of our history. So we want to make sure that we do some level of validation. So actually my product manager and I would actually do a fair amount of that, but it wasn't not from a sales standpoint, more from a like idea of validation standpoint. Yeah. 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 Okay. Testing the market, seeing where you need to make improvements. Exactly. Um, and then what did it look like once you had at least a, a MVP first version where then you were able to go to market and, and connect with customers? How were you able to acquire those first few? Yeah. Well, we were a little bit lucky because of our history, right? So I ran products at ServiceNow. Uh, Fran, who's my head of product, you know, was a big product manager there. So we had a lot of contacts from our, our pr prior world. So it was actually fairly easy for us to be able to reconnect with a lot of them and say, and show them, like show them how we could help automate what today is something that is done in a purely manual function. Mm -hmm. Today, so we're now four and a half, four and a half years in, we haven't talked too much about the successes that we've actually seen, yeah. right? If you don't mind me, I'm going to share that for a moment. Most of our customers are seeing somewhere between, I'd say, 55 to 70% reduction in tickets. Okay, and that's a big number, right? So how can I justify that number? Because it seems like a huge number. Like, how could that possibly be possible? How could that even be possible? Well, there's this thing in the world of support and help desk called a first call resolution rate. Mm -hmm. First call resolution rate is when somebody calls in and your help one, tier one engineer is able to resolve it. Maybe they read a knowledge art article. Maybe they already knew the answer. Maybe they step you through a series of instructions, ask you to reboot your phone, whatever that happens to be. If that gets solved, that's called the first call resolution rate. On average, according to Gartner, first call resolution rates are somewhere between 70 to 80%. Okay, okay. Somewhere in that range for most organizations, there's some that are, you know, not quite as mature, but to me, that's the art of the possible, right? So four and a half years in now, and we're getting customers that are getting really close to that 70%, which is phenomenal. Yeah. So when do you start, right? Before you get to this point where look, we've got case studies, we've got references, we've got you know, all of these things that make it easier for your sales guy to go out there or however you guys deploy your sales team. But did you have to start, is it that you started with POCs with these, with some of the, your first customers? Yeah, we had to do POC. And it was actually a really good learning experience for us as well. Our first year was really, I call it the year of POCs. I think we had like six active POCs and it was really intended to help us determine, A, does the technology actually work? which I think we checked the box on that one, although we found a lot of really interesting things that we had to adapt. The second one is the team and the product ready to scale. Because once we hit the go button, we can't slow down. We're going to have to, if anything is slowing us down, it's going to hurt the business. So this is really the time to go and figure that out. Uh -huh. So we found a number of different ways and areas that we had to go and optimize to be able to get to the level of successes that we're seeing today. Otherwise it would have crushed us. Yeah. What, what were some of the things that you were able to take away from that POC experience? I mean, yeah. were there some things that people really just latched on to, or they say, look, yeah, we would like to convert to a, a paying customer or either where you were able to say, look, the next customer, we need to fine tune our messaging in this way, or we need to present this feature first. 
Yeah, I think I have a laundry list of about 150 things in that category. So I'm going to have to go pick like one or two. Yeah. Um, one of them is was really, that's where the employee language cloud really began. Okay. When we started this journey and we started building all the, the content for, for every customer we had, right? Those initial eight, whatever the number of POCs was. We had to go build out the intents, the entities, the, the triggers and all the stuff that you're very familiar with from an NLP standpoint. What we started realizing is we were basically recreating the wheel over and over and over again. It's like, this is not making a whole lot of sense. Like, why am I doing like this really complex deployment? Haven't I already built something similar to this for another customer? Like why? And of course the matching is only as good as the level of effort you're putting in this particular tenant. Then you go into another tenant that has a different set of triggers, different set of, so you end up with inconsistency. And, and I said, this is never going to scale. So that's where this concept came in of really, I don't like the word crowdsourcing, but I'll use the word crowdsourcing, right? I don't like it because it has kind of a, a negative security connotation to it, but, but we do it in a way that's very secure. So that's where that was born. And that was really, really helpful in getting us to a point today where like a customer can get live and get value like deflections day one in less than six weeks, right? So that was the first part. I think the second part too is really on the messaging side. So how can we, even though everybody understands what we do, right? I think people didn't necessarily want to hear too much about what it is that we do. They really wanted to hear more about how it actually helped them, how it impacted them and how it helped them with their future. So we had to sort of pivot away from just talking about deflecting tickets to enterprise value, to creating outcomes. And that was a big aha moment as well. Yeah, and it took us a little too long for that one, unfortunately, but hey, I think you have so many things you need to learn from and you're, they're all just coming at you when you're getting started. Right, right. And it's interesting because you hear that a lot, right? Like you have this idea of how you should pitch the product, but what the customer hears is totally different. And with people who have a short window of time when they're going to listen to what you have to say, you better be able to speak to some of those value pop in the right way, right? Using the right language. That's right. Were you generally connecting? Who was the person that you would connect with to have these conversations? Who was the, the decision maker? Well, I mean, when we started the company, we would sometimes we would get an audience with a CIO, but normally we would get punted down one or two levels below. It was the person who ran the help desk, the person who owned ServiceNow, the person who, you know, somewhere in that area. Now things are much different, of course, mm -hmm. right? Now that we've got proven customers and lots of references, et cetera. Getting to the CIO is a lot more possible these days. But in the early days, you'd love to, but you can't. They don't have time. You're a nobody. So you basically, you have to go and create your business using the people that, that really will be using your product, mm -hmm. right? So that's who you need to go sell to. And the help desk, it's a little difficult because the help desk doesn't generally spend money, right? So they don't have a budget right, other than headcount, right? Right. And so that, that was always a challenge for us. Okay. And was the CIO, were they generally interested in the fact that artificial intelligence was a driver of what you all ha had created? Or is it to your point earlier, look, here are some of the things that we're, here's the, va here's the value that we're going to yeah. create versus even having a discussion yeah. as to how the tech is built out. Yeah. I think people were intrigued with with AI and knowing that AI was something they had to wrap their arms around because they keep reading about it. It's something that every, it, the, the world is just headed in that direction, but they don't know how to get there from here. So people were excited with the opportunity and yet not quite sure the best approach. And there was a fair amount of bad rap and bad press on AI and a lot of confusion. Like AI was basically an overabused term. So that's why for us, we weren't coming in, and I believe it's one of the reasons why we were successful. We weren't coming in with this toolkit. We were coming in trying to solve a very specific problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just in thinking about the problem that, you, that you're solving, it's very, very tangible. Look, you've got these core issues, employee turnover, mean time to respond. It's like, you can actually grab on to, to those things and be like, here's how we're going to drive value, right? Yep. Hold exactly. us to the fire on it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know we're coming up on time here. I want to get 
I got a couple more questions for you. One, which we, I, I hope I gave you enough, enough time to think about your favorite tech tool, but yeah, what is your favorite or mo maybe most used tech tool at, at Espresso? All right, I'm actually gonna give you a non-traditional answer. It is the first acquisition, the first investment. And I'm actually pretty wise when it comes to spending money, by the way, Darius, okay? okay. Because of my history and my last startup, we ended up getting funded at one of the worst times in financial history. So I learned my lesson to be careful when I spend money. But the first thing that I, actually, I'm going to, do you, can you guess what's the first thing I acquired? The first thing you acquired? A kick-ass coffee machine. Oh, <laughs> that is my favorite. That is my favorite tech go. tool ever. <laughs> there you go. Tradi like traditional coffee machine or did you do the K-Cups? Oh, no, 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 no. It's a traditional, but it was a pretty sophisticated coffee machine that pretty much does everything except polish my shoes. But okay. it is high tech. And uh, that is by far my favorite tech tool because it fuels all the other innovation that happens at the company. Yeah, that's right. Even when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, until I have my coffee, it is not go time. <laughs> <laughs> there um, you go. Okay. And then who is someone who has inspired your journey? This person can be an AI, it can be generally in business. So there's a couple, there's, there's quite a few people out there that I just, I admire the journey that they went through, the challenges that they had to go through. And the fact that they, they had resolve and they just, they stuck with it. Bob Iger would be one of them. I think what he did at Disney is just phenomenal. Schultz at uh, Starbucks is another just, I mean, they're just awesome stories of people that had all kinds of really difficult challenges that they had to go through and they don't give up. And that's my motto, right? That's, I think that's the thing that fuels me every morning besides the caffeine is just the desire to, to make a difference. And I just do not give up. Okay. Yeah. Super helpful. Clearly they have to have some level of uh, what we call stick to it to be able to grow, <laughs> exactly. grow a business to that. So you guys are doing a great job right now. Clearly got the vote of confidence from investors very early on. And I've already seen some success through some of the feedback that you've got from customers as well. So love, you, love what you guys are doing. And this help desk space is obviously from what we've seen in, in the market in terms of now doing and some of the other firms it's like a place where there's a huge pain point that needs to be solved and so i'm sure you guys are going to continue to take off and you know i definitely look forward to keeping keeping up with the journey awesome well it was great chatting with you darius thank you yeah absolutely and appreciate all the nuggets that you share with us